So welcome everybody to day number three. Um, we are going to continue the foot roll and uh, we're going to use this janky scene uh, just because there's stuff around in it, but we're going to start somewhat fresh. We don't really care for the IK that we have in place over much for the leg and this is an approximation. And uh, what we're going to do, uh, picking up from yesterday, from the previous episode, is uh, start working on the foot roll itself. Now, there's a couple of things that are always worth uh, keeping in mind when the, when you do components. So what we outlined previously, oh, let me get this at an angle. What we outlined previously, uh, I can do it, outlined previously, is that um, we do have an idea of what we need to do functionally and we did graph it out to something, you know, approximating what we want which is um, okay we want to do a foot roll and we want that foot roll to actually go into the ankle with an offset and we want that ankle to actually go into the IK and I'm simplifying here now we know that um, as a need of the execution as a need of the evaluation we want these to happen before everything else uh, the other thing that we need to figure out, and that is the basic idea of interface first, which comes in a number of different flavor, uh, different flavors, um, is that you want to figure out all of the boundaries of that. So if you consider everything that is going to go in here as a set, uh, there is a somewhat fuzzy notion about uh, sets. Uh, that is the boundary of the set when a and it's like don't don't take this as gospel. It's not really something that you always find. Um, like a set in theory, in set theory, a set in set theory doesn't really have something like boundaries, but in uh, in programming it's often used. So what happens is that if we consider that set as an node in the graph, uh, and it can receive something and it can also output something, and we've done a fair chunk of these in the first season by showing input and output in the pilot season, we want to know everything that comes into that component. Um, that doesn't depend on anything in the set and we want to find everything that goes out of that component uh, that is only material included in the set so it can't come from another component now usually what we did was if we had a ball and legs um, for input and output we will go okay for the body node that will control the body we would have an output for the hip maybe and so for the leg we would have an output an input for the hip the other part of it is obviously controls so we're going to work on the foot row component. Um, the first thing we care about is uh, giving animators control over what they need. And, uh, and that depends on how, you know, talk to your animators if you have any. If you're a student, uh, find somebody that animates and try and rig for them. Uh, it's probably one of the most important parts, if not the most important part about designing the rig is dealing with the client and very often you disagree with the client and part of experience is knowing uh, when to let the client have it their way uh, even if you know the solution they want isn't as clever or as fun to implement as what you had in mind and sometimes it's about knowing better so if we do um, a foot roll that has multiple stages normally what happens and i do strongly suggest that you go and you know, put a piece of white paper like that and, you know, your cell phone and tripod or balance some books or whatever you want and film yourself uh, with the foot roll, probably even horizontally if you want an ortho. Film yourself actually walking over it. So if, you know, if this is uh, seen from behind or in front or whatever and this is the placement of the camera, film yourself like that with a decent background and look at the angles uh, have some idea of the kinesiology of the foot, how the actual biomechanics of it work. Um, normally, there's a couple of different states to a foot uh, as a system, which is under load and not under load, and they greatly change how the angles work. But to um, surmise what's going to be uh, what's going on, the first thing that normally happens when you have a foot roll, if you start from a position like that and you know your, your rig is gonna be whatever mickey mouse foot or something the first thing that happens is 
on contact, when you raise the foot, this part actually goes up. Then it will reach some threshold, at which point it sort of locks in and it starts lifting the toes. So if we consider this the tarsi, uh, for the sake of naming things, or you could just call it the foot or whatever you want. And we consider this the toes, again, for the sake of having names for stuff that we discuss. Uh, the toes are inert, they do nothing in the beginning, then as you start rolling, you only move the tarsus and they lock in. And the real system is a lot more complex than that. Normally the system under load will actually dig in the foot like that, so you will have both uh, the toes leaning into the ground and um, the tarsi coming up until uh, enough pressure has been exerted on whatever ground, whatever force is opposing it. You have enough compression, you have lock-in, and then it starts lifting. The lifting isn't really exactly coming from the tip. We're actually going to have a look at some of that, but it's uh, it's too complex of a start. So we're going to start with a very mechanical, you know, the foot is entirely rigid, like it's made of pieces of uh, interlocking and hinged metal, and uh, it's a very rigid flat ground. So first thing we want to do is that. Uh, then there's a lock, and what happens is that the... Uh, as you do it, uh, the foot will start lifting like that, then it starts straightening. So there's usually three stages that you want to consider to it, where uh, after some lifting has happened, and what, what happens again, this is the system under load. If you don't put any load on it, so if you balance on your other foot and you just roll your feet, uh, you roll your other foot, uh, you will observe very different angles and behavior compared to when you walk on it. But uh, at some point in this movement, the weight of the body will pretty much be close to coaxial with the um, uh, with the tarsi, or rather with the average sort of of the tarsi and the toes, uh, and the foot will need to release. At that point, normally in a walk, you will have shifted your weight on the other foot, and that one will be considered off the ground. And so what happens is that the foot tends to straighten. So you can't just get away with increasing one rotation, then you increase the other, and then that's it, you're done. Normally you need to first increase the first rotation, that of the tarsi, then you, you, know, you start going and pivoting off the tip, then you straighten, and then at some point after, uh, after lift off, uh, that thing will start resetting. The reset, as somebody walks or, you know, running is a very different thing. Uh, you tend to run in, you tend to run with the, system under load and locked right away if possible so running is a lot more on the tips um, but normally once you're in the air the other thing that happens is that the foot sort of resets and as it resets it will reach a position that's more similar to that which is the classic thing uh, so if this is the leg before it lands it will be in a position like that you land heel first and then as you land it flaps down so that the weight at that point is on the heel, it'll flap down and the cycle uh, basically repeats. So with that in mind, we know that we have more or less three stages that we care about uh, when you're lifting. And you also want uh, to give the animator something for what is often called the heel back, but I've, I've heard it called several different names. Um, now when looking at these as a system, uh, so at this point, like the, the animation requirements should be fairly straightforward. Uh, reality will help a great deal with agreements. Uh, the other interesting part is when you design an interface of any kind, is like how many attributes do you need for something like this? I mean, clearly to describe it, well, maybe not so clearly, but hopefully we'll clarify that, is you need a Tarsi row. So that's your first stage, you know. And uh, the second thing you want is the toe roll. And the third thing you want is a straightening. Now, straightening that is just rebalancing those angles. And the tarsi and the toe and the straightening are all subject to, uh, they're all subjecting. You, you want to automate that, so they're all uh, subjecting to its influence. Uh, the both of the bones so those make for one attributes which is a row 
Now the heel back is always exclusive to that, at least in simple implementations. Uh, there's, there's no real case where you heel back, where you lean on the heel of your foot and you also do some weird roll. I mean, I've, I've seen foot roll setups that uh, forgot the antagonistic behavior and sort of excused it as doing weird things. You might have some curl where you want the foot to, you know, especially if people want anticipation, uh, and they often do, uh, you might go from, instead of like your default being these, uh, you might want the extreme of the heel back to introduce a bit of a curl, because uh, people will often, before landing, they'll want to, if, especially if it's cartoony, they'll want to represent drag by curving the foot backwards. But the point of this is that it's antagonistic to this behavior, which means that the role parameter is the one that's going to deal with all of that. Now, that means that we only have one attribute that we care about, and there's a couple ways you can do it, talking about interface design, and I'm belaboring these possibly, but it's not so much about the foot roll, uh, which is a good example because it has some obvious things and some maybe slightly less obvious things. It's more about try and figure out as much as possible of what defines a component before you start on it. Uh, there's a couple things you can do now. You could go and choose to have it normalized. Um, not a huge fan of it for a number of reasons, but a lot of people go like, oh, okay, a minus one, it's my heel back and a plus one, I'm like that. And then what inevitably happens is that people animate that and they go like, oh, can I change the range of these? And can I change the range of that? And can we change this behavior? So inevitably that normal range of minus one to plus one becomes say, you know, this needs to go to plus 1.3 and stop at minus 0 0.3 because the angle of the heel back is only this much which is much less severe than this combined angle um, so it's a mess uh, and then you know to keep your animation do not have to redo it every time you rearrange this parameter uh, you, you will end up breaking the boundaries of that parameter and it becomes a mess people have to memorize okay this one goes from minus 0 0.4 to plus 1.6 and this other one instead is minus 0 0.2 whatever uh, so use an angle uh, it's not only it's going to be a lot easier for you because instead of having uh, a float that has this arbitrary range in the end that you need to multiply for an angle anyway, it makes it very clear what is going on. So for the row, use an angle. Obviously, there's multiple things happening. So that angle in itself doesn't necessarily represent this angle because there's, there's multiple things coming in. But it's just a lot easier because when you rearrange that, which inevitably will happen as you configure a rig for a new character, as animators uh, want something changed, it's, it's just going to stay cleaner, it's going to be more rational, and it saves you a unique conversion node. Now, the other thing that needs adding, and then we're going to finally start rigging, is, okay, so with this, we've said that we have these stages, where the tarsi roll goes into the toe roll, goes into the straightening. When does that actually happen? So there's, there's some limit of, uh, you know, these joints start in this rest pose, uh, or whatever I had here, so this rest pose, and when they reach this other angle, then the next stage starts. So you have a tarsi roll threshold when you get out of it that we need to add. I'm not going to rewrite all of that. You get the, the yellow other thresholds. Uh, same here, like after a certain amount of compression, you want the first stage to kick in. So you have a toe roll threshold as well threshold is implied in color and then you have the straightening now lastly and this is the configuration part so this is a part that you will probably but not necessarily uh, not show animators not right away uh, and the straightening will be okay when this angle here after the toe roll has engaged so once this tip angle has reached the so as, as this straightens in this stage here, uh, when the tip has pivoted at this angle, then start doing whatever it is that you need to do. So those are, which might be the reset, might be a number of things. Now, um, 
you norm and normally this one basically once you reach the threshold here whatever we're gonna call it uh, normally that's when you neutralize the system and make it inert now for the heel back there's usually not a lot that you will want uh, if you decide to do a tall curl once the heel back reaches a certain position instead of right away um, it can get choppy so we're not gonna add it right away anyway but you could also choose to have a heel back threshold <clears throat> sorry for that Now, the last note about these and what is, you know, your public interface for the controls and what isn't and all of that is uh, don't, you know, and this is the same in programming where people go like, oh, you know, I'm going to make this really rigid interface for things. Um, keep it open. Iterate as often as possible. Give prototypes to animators as often as you can. Uh, hopefully you have a good relationship with at least one animator uh, that will champion the system and help you design it. There's, there's a few things that you might or might not want to expose. So an example, if you're walking um, and if you're, you know, if it's a fairly relaxed walk, you'll find that, well, at least the animator will find that what they want is almost immediately, as soon as, uh, as soon as the heel is off the ground, they don't want for, you know, very strong bend before it does that. It will almost immediately take off the shoe. And if you have some rigid shoes on, that will be accentuated even more because the system is given more rigidity and weight is more further up front. So it's very possible that you will find that these thresholds are something that needs to be exposed. And then you get into the usual thing about, you know, how many parameters are too much complexity, you know, uh, if they're animated instead of configured for that shot, does the animator want to deal with it? If, you, if they're animatable, do you have to deal with some weird interactions? But the point is, try and not make too many assumptions about whether those will be animated or not. And if you can develop a system that deals with animation on all parameters, then you're usually better off. So hopefully all of that makes sense. That is what we want for the system so that we know what parameters we have. So we know we have one row and definitely not the window I wanted. We know we have one row, which is the parameter we want to add. So we make our list. Um, and I would encourage you to do these things on paper. And we know that it's public. Um, we know that we're going to have the first threshold. And uh, if you're in that, whether you, you know, you're going to give them to animators or not, normally you want to name them somewhat sense, something sensible. In prototype stage, maybe you can afford to change names and break animation, but uh, when you're getting closer to delivery. But um, let's say that we call these the Tarsi lock or the Tarsi lock angle, but uh, we're gonna omit angle from the parameter name. Then we're gonna, so that's when the Tarsi lock and the, uh, and the toes actually start pivoting. Then the next thing we care about is, okay, at some point, you know, the toes have reached that limit and we want to straighten it. So we're going to call that the straighten threshold. Uh, or the straighten angle. So we might even not omit that angle. And uh, you might notice that these seem to be one ahead of these and you can name things based on what state they're entering. So, you know, that lock leads to the next stage. So you call it like the next stage or you could name things like the state you're in and the condition of exiting. And then the last thing we don't care just yet for the beginning of the system, which is what happens when you want to uh, render the system in Earth. Now, we know we need at least these, these two to configure the rig and this one to actually manipulate it. And we know that we want a couple of joints, so we are going to start with that. So I hope that the bones are actually readable now um, in pre-stream. I was, uh, well, stream pre-recording, I was actually fiddling with the UI. So here's another thing, like very often, 
like when I was, uh, you know, reading groups or lectures or stuff like that, when I ask people, like, if you have a problem, if there's something you can't solve, what do you do? And I often hear as an automatic reply that's been ingrained in people's brains, oh, you take a step back and you look at the big picture. Don't look at the big picture. Uh, it's rubbish. This kind of stuff lives in detail. Find the smallest possible problem that you know uh, you can solve and start working on that and work on that fast and push it around. That is why we do this kind of stuff. That is why you try and break it down like that. Because at one point, you know, okay, I know for a fact that this part of the system is completely bound. I know exactly what's coming into it. I know exactly what's coming out of it. I know how to solve it. I'm going to work on that. Uh, the big picture is just going to confuse you in that case. Doesn't mean that you never want to look at the big picture, but um, certainly not all the time, like it seems to be suggested as a solution for every problem in the world. So, for all input, output, we don't really need the output, so we're not going to bother with that just yet. We're going to have some control. Chat is very quiet and very low population today. Uh, but again, stop me, something doesn't make sense or if you think something needs to be, if there's any dead horses you see that need to be beaten any further, let me know. So, this is the boring, noddling, outlining part. Uh, what I want is, don't really even care to have an ankle control just yet. Um, I do possibly care about getting these things out of the way. So let's call that a sketch. It's like pork, we throw away nothing. Let me save, not that we did much. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know why I find it funny. Somebody was saying too entranced to talk. I hope you were serious. Uh, anyway, so let's say that we call something settings, uh, not a config, which will be more of a guide thing. And let's say that we have another panel. Um, we'll figure out what names we want, but. Um, I don't want to just use what I've used at work though. That's the convention that I've used at home as well uh, and brought to work with me. But uh, let's say that we go for adding parameters for sure, uh, config parameter maybe, sure. So we know that we need a couple of these. Uh, let's leave that out for now, but we'll keep it in there. So. Going back to and you know, it'd be a lot easier if you actually had an notebook and this is what I normally do. You have a notebook, you go through your notes, you sketch things out. <clears throat> normally you'll find that in a few pages once you get the hang of it, uh, you practically have the rig done with very little work that's done in my itself. <clears throat> and uh, we know that we want possibly some sort of feedback threshold, but we say we wouldn't add it yet. Now, I was talking about attributes, so this is a Maya specific thing. Um, by default, if you just select something and you go attribute, add attributes, your choices are super limited. I've never figured out why uh, they do this. Maya is a very strong typing, so you can have things that are very explicitly typed to mean something very precise. Um, but for some reason, they don't expose it or they expose only a small subset of it. And, and that's what gets into a ton of unique conversion nodes and messy graphs and all of that. Uh, normally, like I've, I've done my own UI for that stuff because it's all trivial to wrap and give it a better UI. So there's a command you want to look at, which is add actor. Uh, this is the Mel version because it's, you know, as much as I don't like Mel as a programming language when you just want to punch in a command and have them do, it's convenient. And here you can see how many types uh, Maya actually has. It's quite a few, and there's some attributes that are, you know, hardly used at all that are that can be quite powerful, like the inbuilt arrays, uh, spare you from 
a lot of handle array handle costs in some nodes. But anyway, I digress. What we want is called a double angle and it should be somewhere in here. There you go. And um, this is basically gonna create an angle that is, uh, sorry, an attribute that is of type angle. So it won't require any conversion nodes for what we're doing. Uh, it, it might because then a lot of nodes will want the user uh, work on floats and Maya will deal with the conversions for you. Uh, with the conversions as well as the UI conversions. So I actually did type this in, I did make sure that I wasn't hallucinating because all of this stuff I've wrapped away in UI for so many years now. So animation parameters, we only want the row and you can actually give it a range as well. You can give it soft mean and soft max. Can we see the UI? Uh, no, I'm afraid you can't just yet, uh, but there, there will be a reason for that eventually. So it's it's gonna go public, but in, in this specific case, I meant uh, at work. So there's definitely stuff that I don't have here. Uh, I also have a bunch of tools that, uh, you know, I brought for myself at home, but very often they have uh, text interfaces and stuff like that. Uh, at, at home, I don't tend to rig a lot. I tend to do a lot more programming. So my environment isn't as rich as the one I have at work. Now, uh, with that in, there should be things like mean and max that you can set here as well. So has soft mean value, has soft max value, there you go. So the difference between mean and max and soft mean and max is that mean and max literally binds your value to minimum and maximum of some sort. And uh, soft mean and max just bind the UI. So we know that we're not going to deal with more than 180 and you know, we know that we're not going to heal back more than 90. I mean, we know it's like, you never know what animators will do or what a special rig might require, but for this case. So the other thing we want to add is mean value and max value, which should be, is there a short for those? Actually, is there a soft mean value? Yes, there is SMN. And so soft max is SMX. And those might, so this will be radians, which means 180 is 3.14, it's pi, uh, and 90 is half pi. Now I don't know if the input it wants is in float or radians, so uh, soft mean value, we'll try it. So for the soft mean, we want uh, quarter pi kind of, so let's say 1.7 will do. And for the soft max, you will want, and I normally don't use the male one, so hopefully the syntax is not gonna bite me in the ass. Let's say 3.13, there you go. So by doing it, it's actually ranged it. And as you see here, so that's actually, it takes the radians. What's happening there is that just in the UI, internally Maya knows that these are radians, uh, which means that they range uh, around the circle. Uh, so they range around pi, but whenever it renders them in the UI, and if you were to print the value, it will give you these. It will tell you that, you know, if I set something to 180 degrees and you print the value straight up, it will normally give you pi. Uh, but when it renders them in the UI, when it renders the sliders and the fields, it converts them for you. Uh, whether it's good or bad, I, I can't tell for sure, but I don't mind it. And it's also good to see that this actually works on on Linux. For some reason, these would appear as an empty slider. So hopefully still all making sense. Like that was a, yeah, that was a considerable chunk of talking for just adding one attribute, but hopefully we'll progress faster here. So in our list, we say we would have Darcy lock angle and straighten angle. Let's do that. Let's not argue our own names. Uh, and if you do it as a mail command, undo will just happen to work right away. So we say we want actually, let me rerun these because the other two we say we'll put in config. And at this point, um, these are in some private interface. So I'm not gonna bother with the names too much. If an animator happens to use them, uh, minus K is for keyable, by the way, so that they are keyable, like set function curse and appear in there. Um, 
I'm not gonna bother over much with the names because if we expose them and they play with them and they go like, yeah, we need to animate these because as it goes from a walk to a run, we find that, you know, if we animate those, we actually get an interesting behavior. And changing those thresholds, if the component is formed well enough, can actually get to some interesting mid of the way behaviors that is less rigid than kung kung kung. So, press the lot, straighten, and good. Now, again, normally I would just resolve most of the stuff in DG nodes and I'll put a transform, but we say that for, well, I say it at least, and I have to abide, that for this stream, we'll try to do things as factory, as vanilla as possible, take them as far away as possible with the vanilla experience, um, with, you know, without too much convolution, without custom nodes and stuff like that, for sure. And um, see how we go. Because at this point, like this season should have more rigging and I'm not gonna say less theory because there's probably still gonna be enough. Now, note about joints. Uh, again, this is how I tend to use Maya. It doesn't mean that it's a good way to use it or how you should use it but I tend to use very little of it, as little as I possibly can. So another thing with Maya is that when you create joints, if you create them at, okay, sure. For some reason, this napping didn't work first time around. When you create joints, if they, they have some presets and um, they also connect the scale for scale compensation, which not a fan of, but, um, there will be joint orientation going on and apparently the scale in this case the compensation was weird uh, and it will set a joint orientation for you so i always draw whatever i need with no regard like just however many i need down the x-axis so that the joint orient is zeroed out uh, because i don't like having additional transforms i thought as snap but maya disagreed sure it's okay. And this is just the translate. There should be no rotation. The by might not have snapped as you know as accurately as I thought I would have had. I don't know, it doesn't make sense. Anyway, so don't have joint orient if you can, and you know, unless you're using joints for animation as well and 3 dfk IK mixing blending. Um, and you will spare yourself a fair amount of trouble. Uh, I like to have just one set of data that I have to take care of. I'm too stupid to actually take into consideration four different possible matrices for two different people. So the base transform plus joint orient as well. Now, uh, I also say that I actually wanted two joints because uh, we're going to do right away both the toe and tarsi. So actually, let's also do something like that. And in Maya parameters are called attributes, so I'm intentionally naming this something different. Uh, just to avoid confusion. So we'll use nap. Sure. You might have it. It did. Yay. Now, the reason why I added that <coughs> is that uh, right away, I would like to actually be able to configure some things. So if the foot roll is like that, I will normally, for the sake of making everything as simple as possible, as well as being in a zero case, which is, you know, sometimes it makes everything easier than you go uh, far out of, you know, your expected domain and you haven't worked for too long, close to the zero case will bite you in the ass. But very often working through the zero case and going like, okay, the default of my foot roll before I fit it into the rig is going to be these. Having these as parameters, that's that's basically already constituting some sort of guiding. And there's also a couple lengths that we're interested in. So because we say we're going to do that from the interface, we're going to start setting yourself up for success and do that as well. Uh, hopefully still all making sense up to here. Let me move these out of the way, actually. Um, yeah, sure, I'll just add something. Come on. I'll just add something in there as a placeholder. Let's 
See, this is part that does my head in. I don't know the pairing command. Maybe it's maybe joints are involved. If there is a special command now to parent joints, uh, and if you don't use it, parent gets broken. Whatever. And so we also we do have joints we want now. All of that spiel is that we're gonna say and let's keep doing our paper thing. We're gonna because I've done this so many times. Um, you know, probably like it's kind of hard for me to remember how much I need to show. But anyway, so these are our guide parameters. And we're going to say, okay, what, what do we need? We actually certainly need that. So let's say that will be the total rest angle. And we're going to imply that it's a rest. And because it's in the guide, and we're going to maybe imply that it's an angle because it's that type. Uh, but then you have the length, so no. And um, then you have a couple of choices. You could choose to configure this angle. Uh, for how those go so you could say hey you know the rest pose is like what's the angle between the tarsi and the uh, and the toes or you could choose to go straight up you know down the chain we're gonna rig in this direction for the first part of the foot roll so we could call that the tarsi rest angle And we know we want to add those two now if we want to do a complete guide and we're not going to finish the foot roll today not by far but what i wanted to do is get the interface out of the way and we should be able to do it then we also need the toe length which is actually going to be um <coughs> sorry again it's going to be a float you also have a unit attribute for distance uh, which is a double under the hood but um we are going to use plain stuff So here's like, look, it's somebody in the chat was saying, breaks my brain how little of the factory operations you need. Um, I'm kind of neutral about Maya. I'm not, you know, I'm not much of a uh, software warrior for any platform really. I've, I've kind of come to dislike that attitude. And Maya is at this point fairly old and they managed to modernize some parts of it, you know, unexpectedly. Uh, and that was not an easy thing to do, and I'll, I'll cut them plenty of slack for that. There is something that Maya did get right in how basic it is, and you know the original API and how it ended up developing over the years and all of that. If you know Maya doesn't hide a lot from you. There's there's a few because of that they paid for it when they had to implement certain tools and they make a really odd use of the graph where they conflate state and. Uh, data and evaluation and some some tools will modify the graph topology for you and they shouldn't it's like you you can find plenty fault in it it's far from perfect but there is something they got right in how close it is to some of the basics and if you know enough of the basics which is kind of the point of doing code to free you you know you, you need a viewport and a graph evaluation and both things are really hard to write and both things you get out of maya so use it for that now I was completely off a tangent that I didn't need to go down to, but whatever. We're gonna say that we'll have, let's call it Tor Rest, Darcy Rest. Um, probably fine to have negatives, we're not gonna be super fussy about it. But let's say that for some misguided sense of wow, whatever, let's keep them as they are. We can always soft min and soft max. So here's the thing min and max, uh, once you set them, it's uh, pretty tricky to change them without deleting the attribute. Soft mean and max, you can change however many times you want very trivially. So if you're in doubt about the range of an attribute and you're in prototyping stage, I would suggest you don't, because in prototyping, you normally wiggle the sliders a lot. You're not gonna do uh, a lot of like number hammering by scripts or things that check wide domains and stuff like that. I would suggest just use soft mean and max so that you get yourself a UI that you can manipulate uh, yep, one more tangent, but this one was on topic. And again, I'm gonna make everything keyable, so it's an advisable, uh, because at this stage, uh, I don't know what I'm gonna do or what the animator is gonna ask. So for that, is there a distance? Let's try. Definitely wanna change these. Do we? No, we never have a minimum that we want negative. So for distances, 
How do I keep doing that? And let's give ourselves something not insane for the length of those. Will that work? No. Value numeric attribute. So I boo booed something. Default value, min value, only valid for numeric attributes. So how is distance not, whatever. Whatever, my, it might not be called distance, it might have been. Nah, there's no such thing as distance in here, is there? Uh, there should be a plain double and we can use that. So double angle, double linear. I think double linear in this case is what under the hood distance uses, but let's not complicate their life unnecessarily. No valid item to add the attribute to. Ah, because I'm stupid. So there's a name conflict and it's uh double it. Yeah. So somebody in chat just uh caught up to the same thing I said because of the stream delay. Um this is one of the things I don't like about Maya. Like it's it's gonna be super tiny for you, but um found no valid items to add the attribute to when the real problem was it was a name clash because I forgot to rename these and it's really errors are important give me reasonable error names anyway so this should actually ah see it's decided to completely ignore my desire to have 0 0.01 as a mean We'll deal with it for now. Uh, I don't want to spend hours debugging stuff in the stream. And let's leave that. Uh, I've been asked a couple of times, if you see me doing things like moving something by clicking anywhere, resizing a window, this is a super normal thing in Linux. Uh, Windows doesn't have anything to do it. There's a program called OutDrag, um, which will add this functionality and have it bound to Mita. Uh, Mita is the Windows key on your keyboard, so it is mandatory. As far as I'm concerned, like the ability to do these, it's like you can't use an operating system with Windows without being able to just click, um, hold down a button and click wherever you want. So non-rigging tip of the day, but I love that application. I'd be lost without it. And then... I keep digressing, but we'll get there eventually, I promise. We don't really care for the position of these. We might care to have a buffer to move it around, but not yet. Uh, we do care to affect the position of that and that, as well as their angles. So we're going to get these two. And I swear that if I did not have to stream normally this stuff, I'll just, even with Vanilla Maya, would just blaze through, but... <clears throat> remembering what to explain and what not and all of that uh, don't need that is uh, it makes operations tricky brain not good enough so we say that we want those two I really want to sever that connection but I won't until I explain how things work and that will be when we do the uh, IK side of things so I have to resist that temptation. I have to command myself for my self-control. Now, one other thing that we might want to mention since we did, uh, we did talk uh, about uh, interfaces a little bit. I've kind of already lost my train of thought here. So I'll, I'll pick it up later on. Let's not interrupt this too much. So, we do have that, then, and this is the part where you can see that this is an actual angle attribute. Um, okay, so this is not yet relevant, uh, but axis alignment can be a major pain in the back. So very often animators will go, okay, this is an IK control, so where is it aligned to? Like when you create a control, your manipulator for that stuff, 
is it rolling down the X? Is it rolling down the Z? Uh, what are our standards and so on? Like for now, I am not caring about it, but eventually, uh, and once you get those things set, uh, animation, cool freeze those parameters in stone. If you make the wrong calls, you can pay through the nose for it in a show. Uh, knowing what axis you want to align to is very important. So if you have expectations, if you have standards, like respect them right away. Right now I'm doing the simplest possible thing, which is just using the way Maya wants it, which is joints roll down the X and I'm aligning to that. I'm building an interface that just needs to crunch numbers, uh, which is another thing that I like about these. All I, all I care about is because I said I want to generate one offset and a couple of angles. I don't care what plane it leaves in there. They're just a handful of numbers that I'm gonna toss around. So join to now the angle for the rest we actually do want on joint one obviously enough haven't gone completely see now yet i do remember stuff occasionally and i imagine that will be the z yeah so the toe rest is gonna be inside the rotate z um, and the So the other thing I will suggest doing is once once you have attributes, copy tab, which can be a little bit buggy with refresh, but not on, on such simple things. And, you know, wiggle stuff right away to see if what you're doing is right. The earlier you test expectation on a system, the less pain there will be later on. So at that point, you know, we got the length not configured. So we're going to hook that one up as well. We're about one hour into it, so we might stop here. Start piling up the questions in chat, uh, if you have any, please. And next thing we we'll want to do. So this is going to be, I thought I did. Hmm. I did take care of the length. Oh, yeah. No, it is working. So, yeah. Okay, no, never mind. I don't know why. I thought I wiggled the slider and saw no effect. It might have been the Tarsi length and this might have been wiggling behind this view. So, okay, I guess we mostly have the base of a guy to configure a rig uh, or at least the default state of the foot roll. Again, nice thing, I, nice thing about having systems so isolated is that it becomes very, very easy to create multiple pieces of data from it. So I could very easily create the rest pose based on the guide, sorry, rest offset, because I might need both uh, the rest offset as well as the final offset to figure out the displacement between the two rather than just having one offset that constantly changes. Um, but anyway, so that will be it for the guide. For a setup like this, do you make an interface for the animator? Uh, an interface for the animator is in control in the viewport. Uh, if so, it depends. Like right now, I'm trying to solve the system in terms of input and output going like, how many attributes do I need? And how many attributes do I need to output? Uh, and what are they? And get the system to work those out. So remember when I said a function is a coupling between domain and codomain, this is kind of what I'm trying to do here, which is I have a codomain, which for me is all the possible offsets generated by that ankle moving and the angle between the toe and the tarsi. Uh, and that's all I want to generate. It might, you know, take the shape of multiple angles and more than one transform and stuff like that, but that's, that's all I care about. If you do it that way, if you build a very simple system that does only that and exactly that, then you can choose to interface to it whichever way you want. So you could create, you know, an herb circle and take the uh, take the rotation of it and pipe that rotation into one of your attributes so that when the animator rotates that control what you're really doing is you're rotating uh the role that is in there it's it becomes a triviality your system is very easy to interface with if that's what you were asking if it's something else uh hopefully that was still useful to hear but let me know what it is so i guess we can go on for another few minutes but not much more what do we want to do more with these mm -mm -mm. we could start connecting the the roll right away so 
we already have a guide at this point and we don't have like we do have the thresholds but we're not respecting them yet so let's say that we start with the first stages wall uh, and we call it a day at day and I'm gonna go for much longer so the next thing we're gonna do is actually uh, ranging all of those things and that's probably gonna take us a fair bit of noddling so this is what I wanted to start from yesterday which is uh, binding your problem by its interface but Today is as good as yesterday for it. So at this point, when we're talking about the set and the boundaries, like this will be all contents of my footwork component or subcomponent or whatever you want to call it. Uh, let's also save. And, uh, and these will be the early boundaries to the Oracle. You, you can call it the leading edge, the early edge, the leading boundary, the early boundary. It's all the same thing. Uh, I tend to call early and late. Uh, some people use leading and trailing and uh, this will be nothing that moves the mechanics of this system should ever come from anything other than an interface that we say is you know that's the law that's that's what gets you your information so for the role we now know that we have a base from the guy that we want to respect uh, and eventually that might become a constant you know once the rig is configured but for now we're going to keep it dynamic so there is an add double linear yes uh i don't need that i actually want double angle angle is there an add angles there was an add angles wasn't there and in blend node additive da double angle yeah so a lot of this stuff came in when they added layers <coughs> Sorry for that, it gets a throat gets scratchy after over an hour. A lot of this stuff they added when they added layers and they're actually pretty decent nodes. Uh, so this is a blend, but I want an add. Uh, and in blend node additive, the A is double angle. Now, this is a blend, so not what I want for sure. Oh, whatever. If anybody remembers if there's an ad for angles, uh, let me know, please. For now, we're going to pay the cost of um, the unit conversion nodes, but I am going to use uh, a double linear. So we say that we want the Tarsi rest plus the actual row. Yes, teleport my nodes. I love it when you teleport my nodes. I love it even more when you teleport them in unexpected places. They really need to fix this thing. Like the unique conversion nodes messing with the graph layout is infuriating. And uh I know that you can pin the nodes, but that makes for even weirder teleportation. Yeah, someone was saying they don't know of one either for adding angles. It always does my head in that there is not one, but whatever. Uh, and what we will want is to affect so that's locked by the connection it will be that so any bets on where the unit will end and where these two nodes will end up there you go rearranged all of it Autodesk if you're watching this fix this fix the node editor please this is painful is there a reason it's not in the guide group, but instead in the control? Uh, no, there is no reason. I'm like, this is super sketchy. So sorry, the question was, is there a reason that the guide parameters uh, is not in the guide group, but instead in the control? There is no good reason for that. Um, that's why I was saying, don't take any of what we do uh, this far for gospel. Like, what we care about is giving our virtual animators that we don't have something as soon as possible, like get stuff on their screen. Like if, if possible, every few hours, uh, software and rigs, which just software should be iterated on a, you know, 
at least daily basis when you're this early in the uh, in the development I, I constantly I've, I've seen a lot I've heard a lot of people that spend like days and days on a component goes to the animator animator instantly breaks it and you go like oh well that's nature of the beast you know debugging is what it is and it's it but eventually it turns out to be a major design flow and it would have been avoided and and maybe they talk to the animator it's not that they're completely ignoring the client it's just animators have superpowers they can break anything and everything and you want to break stuff as often and early as possible early being key there so I reckon that with the first part of our foot roll done, we can call it for now. So we're going to start adding the staging and all of that. Um, probably going to do a short stream during the work week uh, and hopefully get across that so that we get the full behavior or at least, you know, some half of it. Um, doo -doo -doo. Yeah, that would be it. So, kind of anticlimactic, but for now, you know, we, we got somewhere that feels like uh, it's a point that I can stop at. I'm not leaving anything suspended for now. We got a guide, we got a bunch of stuff in scene that we can start playing with. We got the idea of interface and we know what we want to do with it in there. Uh, the next step will actually be doing some of the mechanics work. So, there's not a lot of questions that piled up, in fact, like most of them I answered already, if not all of them. Uh, so we might be calling it. I'll give you guys another 30 seconds or something like that. And there's, there's a comment in chat, can't wait until we get my API and every other error is unexpected internal error. I think it's unexpected internal failure, isn't it? And yes, that comes up a lot for the stupidest reasons, but they're wrapping an API, which is notoriously nasty for errors. Like it's pretty hard to wrap an API and do good errors and not lose a ton of performance. All right, chat is quiet. We've done our job, we've done the hour, we're at a set point. I'm gonna call it, so Thanks everybody for watching these if you're watching it on YouTube. Thanks everybody on the stream for keeping me honest and attending. Uh, and yeah, have a good day and I'll see you again soon and we'll get into the actual meat of the mechanics.